Thank you, Judy, for those inspiring remarks and for the great work you continue to do. I now have the honor of introducing a distinguished panel of experts who will explore many of the issues surrounding violence against women and girls, um, each from a unique um, perspective. Uh, joining our panel this morning are Maria Bello, an actor and activist who has just returned from Haiti yesterday afternoon, where she has worked extensively over the past three years to ensure that women have a choice um, in their country's recovery and reconstruction and a voice um, in that work. Sean Callahan is Vice President for Overseas Operations at Catholic Relief Services, who has recently returned from Africa and has extensive experience working in South Asia and Afghanistan. Kent Hill, Senior Vice President for International Programs at World Vision United States and previously with USAID, where he oversaw all of the agency's global health programs. Edna Edan Ishmael, who I had the pleasure of dining with last night along with Maria, an internationally recognized activist against female genital mutilation from Somaliland, and recently named by Newsweek as one of 150, 150 women who shake the world. And Siham Salman, program manager in Iraq with Islamic Relief Worldwide, where she manages a range of projects offering a comprehensive approach to gender-based violence. Please join me in welcoming each of them, along with Ritu Sharma, who will moderate the panel. you can get to your chocolate. Um, there is a speed bump between you and your chocolate. You will notice that on each of your place settings uh, is a card with the story of a survivor um, of violence, uh, which we gathered from our colleagues around the world, from Amnesty International and World Pulse Media. And one of the things that uh, is very important to Women Thrive worldwide is that we really don't want to be an organization that talks about these issues, that just talks and talks and talks, which is something that occasionally happens in Washington, D.C. We are an organization that is about action. Um, we get mad and we do something about it. So if you open your card, there is an invitation to you to take some action in whatever sphere you work in, uh, in your personal life, in your professional life, at your school, at your church. We just ask you to do something, do something um, after this breakfast. So if you would take a moment while we're having our panel to fill out the cards and leave them on your table, and, and then you can enjoy your chocolate. So we are really pleased to be here to be talking about this issue. And some of the themes that we want to explore this morning are that although this issue is very complicated, it intersects with culture, religion, uh, politics, uh, intra-household relationships, it is something that can be ended. There are programs that work and they are very, very cost effective. And you're gonna hear about some of those programs this morning. One of the reasons that gender-based violence continues to be an epidemic is because we have not named it as an epidemic. When a third to a half of women and girls in a society are survivors of beating and rape, it takes an enormous toll on them but on their ability to work, on their ability to go to school, on their ability to be effective participants in their nations. And in a way, that's the intent of the violence, isn't it? The intent is to keep women down. But we need to name this as the public health epidemic that it is 
and garner and, and inspire the kinds of resources that we have been able to around HIV AIDS, around tuberculosis and malaria. This disease affects many, many, many more people than any of those diseases combined. So without um, further ado, I want to open it to our panelists and ask each of them to say a little bit about what works. What have you seen that that works? And let me ask Maria, since you are fresh off the plane from Haiti and you look incredible for having just been <laughs> off the plane from but you always look incredible. So tell me about the work that you're doing there and the kinds of things that you've seen that actually make a difference. Um, the number one thing that I've seen that makes a difference in um, Haiti and around the world is local solutions to local problems. We don't need to go into uh, a country like Haiti and tell the women, especially the women activist group, what needs to be done to stop gender-based violence. They know better than anyone what they need. Why we started my organization, um, We Advance, or Not Bonse in Creole, was because after the earthquake, uh, I saw a lot of my Haitian women friends, activists who'd been working for years all over the country, um, who had lost everything, who were out on the streets, like my co-founder Barbara Guillaume, finding lost children, starting camps, starting health centers, starting education centers for women with no funding. And the billions of dollars that poured into Haiti after the earthquake, and I was there six days after the earthquake, and none of that money was being funneled to the local women's organizations. So we started We Advance basically with our Haitian colleagues because we were pissed off. We were pissed off that all of these international funds, NGOs, and even our own, even our own uh, country, a uh, report just came out about where the money was spent in Haiti after the earthquake. And uh, nothing was mentioned about gender, about how, what money went towards, uh, towards specifically women's programs. And so we're finding in Haiti that there is so much hope alive. We've just had a, a women's conference that ends today, an international women's conference. We did 315 focused groups throughout the country um, with Vital Voices and Bank of America's help. We had the international conference the last four days where 40 representatives came from the provinces to create a women's platform that they're presenting to the president tonight and that we will present to the U.S. government Excellent. as well to, to fix this problem. Yeah, and I think that part of this solution is that the other thing about local women's organizations is that they are extremely cost efficient. They're cheap. They're really cheap. They're really cheap to support. Five thousand dollars can go an incredibly long way. Not even five thousand. I was with a mango farmer association last week that one of my friends runs. Four thousand women strong. A woman, a, a, a victim of sexual violence, came there that day. A 19-year-old girl who had been beaten, threatened to rape, almost raped. All they needed was a hundred and twenty-five dollars a month in order to keep a lawyer on retainer to file her papers. So thank goodness we were, we advanced, was able to get them the money quickly so that they could continue that. But you're right, it's very cost effective. Absolutely. Siham, talk about your experience with this um, in Iraq, which is probably one of the most difficult countries to work in for a whole variety of reasons, but you've done some extraordinary things. Yeah, of course. Uh, our work in Iraq is Islamic Relief is targeting the uh, families in rural areas. And it's really hard for an organization to approach families in such area. So what we do is we select the, uh, the exact project that this area is needed. For example, if there is an area where there are all like fam uh, farmers are living, we uh, established like an agricultural project. And that was really one of the most successful projects we ever run. Because if the father is a farmer, so the wife is assisting him and all the kids. So from there, we gave them like small grants and it starts really improving their quality of their life. And I did before and after assessment and uh, violence against women, uh, actually it was really high before that project. And then after the project, like the family was really living in peace. And it was not a very big project. It was a small project, but it really has really big effect. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back, Siham, to this, to this idea of how you slipped in the violence issue with the agricultural 
focused program, mm -hmm. and and why did that work so well? Mm -hmm. um, what we did, we uh, we started an assessment to know what's number one reason behind violence against women in that specific area, and poverty was number one reason. So we we planned for uh, a project where we can provide that fam these families with. Uh, certain number of uh, certain amounts of money just to start their lives, and since that the, that area was all agricultural area, so we started an agricultural project, which was really really successful. So the whole family was working and the uh, in their farm, so everybody returned back tired at the end of the day. So uh, everybody was happy. The uh, the, the uh, father or, or the husband was getting some money, and the the mother too, and the kids start enrolling school and um, so there was really a really very good uh, impact on that uh, project but since that day the violence uh, recorded was really like 60 percent less than before the project 60 wow. that's phenomenal yeah that's phenomenal um, Edna I want to move to you and we talked a lot yesterday about the importance of working with men and boys and that one of the reasons we felt that we haven't made more progress on this issue is because we've sort of let them off the hook. Yeah, um, you're quite right. Uh, I'm from Somaliland, and I particularly address problems of women, whether it's um, the lack, to, um, no access to education, to jobs, whether it's poverty, violence against women, or whether it's focused on the problem of female genital mutilation. And uh, when one starts a campaign against something that one feels very strongly about, you are led by your heart and your emotions. But then there are times when you need to go back to the drawing board and say, now, what have I done right? What could I do differently? And how can I overcome this problem that I'm addressing in a better way. Now, when it comes to female genital mutilation, I am not going to put every grandmother and every mother in jail because FGM is done out of a sense of duty. They think they're doing the right thing. We were trying to convince illiterate women, mothers and grandmothers, about FGM, which is contrary to the teachings of Islam, but they thought it was a religious <coughs> obligation. So you need to inform them about this. Uh, they thought they were doing the right thing, that it's hygienic, which it is not, that it would improve their marriageability, which it does not, because it, it interferes with their potential to reproduce and have children. And when we went back to the drawing board, we found that major, we had overlooked the role, the major role that men should and must play in this. Because this little girl who is being cut up is the daughter of a father. And parents, both mothers and fathers, must join hands. And it cannot remain a a feminist issue, it's a human issue, it's a family issue. So we began to incorporate men into this and how I would go about it is you are the father, it is your daughter who is being subjected to this and as the leader of this family, the strong head of this family, you must have a say in this matter. And you must put your foot down and say, my daughter will not go through this. Show your strength. Show your heroism. Show me how brave you are. It shouldn't be left to, I often use this, to little old women like me. It should be the responsibility okay, of she's men. not a little old woman. Like Why? Right now. Men. <laughs> with big turbans and big beards and wise and knowledgeable should be telling me to do something about it. So this is, this is how we go about it and I, and I think it works better. 
because it's not something that we campaign against because of the particular damage it does to the female reproduction, but it damages the human value of that girl. It damages, if she has no say in this, she must have a say. She must be consulted in this. Now, something that I, I really would like to take advantage of in this company. A few days ago, when I was getting my visa to enter your great country, I saw something on the consulate, uh, American consulate's wall in Djibouti, something that I had been fighting for for over a decade. And I saw it happen. There was a warning in the American consulate about FGM. And I thought, thank God, I've lived to see this day. Now, this is a very strong weapon, a diplomatic weapon. And if the world can join hands, whether it's the US or Canada or Europe or wherever, countries where immigrants like to go to, if that warning is given at the point of entry where they are seeking the visa, I think it would be a big deterrent. And we would feel, we from countries where this is perpetrated, will feel that we have allies, that we are being supported in this. And the message is that if you damage your daughters while in the United States, this will be seen as an act of violence and a criminal act. Thank God. Now, the only thing I, I, I would like to bring to your attention is that since a tree has been cut down to make paper, for this paper to be put on a wall, the wording should be a little bit stronger. It's a little bit weak. <laughs> but since we've had the courage to say it and put it in the embassy and put it in the consulate, it should be a much bigger deterrent. Now, when you can buy a cannon, why buy a pistol? <laughs> yesterday and the first thing she says hello and then she hands me this notice from I have a copy of it from, um, the, from the, the the consulate wall and so but we will be following up with the State Department to work on some stronger wording for that and thank you for, t for having that courage yeah. being the first country in the world who's done it so I commend you and congratulate you and thank you for it so I want to turn now to the men on our panel and thank you so much for being here um, Sean, Catholic Relief Services has, has been addressing this issue head on, which is, I think, incredibly um, enlightened and, and, and tremendous, and also certainly in line with Catholic principles, no doubt. But tell us a little bit about, in your experience, what's working for you all. Okay. Well, f first of all, just to, to put it in, in, in the proper framework, um, as Ritu said, it is a pandemic. Uh, and as we look around and try to address this pandemic, we shouldn't just think of it um, as a female issue. And it, it's, it's wonderful that we have a session like this here today so that we can radiate it out. But we do have to make this more a societal issue because not providing uh, opportunities for women is, and it's not just the violence against them, it's the lack of opportunities for them to be able to participate in society. And as we see that in various ways, and you can see some of the areas that we've, we've had some great success. Um, in in uh, the fall, I came back from Afghanistan, where we've been working in the 90s and, and 2000, and then more recently. And when you start seeing women, young women now, coming out in the streets, and if you're there at 11 o'clock or 11.30 in the morning, and seeing young women now walking through the streets with freedom that have just come back from school, you start seeing the successes and the empowerment that we've had. Uh, when you go out to Eastern Congo, where we've had some of these horrible tragedies that the Congresswoman just, just mentioned. But now there's programs on trying to educate the military on how they interact with women. When we go to South Asia and we talk to communities, not about um, what men should do and what women should do, but just articulating how men and women participate in the life of the community. And we started doing some research and studies on how, much, how many hours of work do the women do in this community and how many hours of work do the men do in the community? And when the community started seeing one person is working 18 hours a day and another is working eight hours a day, the value of those people increase, increase uh, exponentially. So as we see some of the outreach that we try to do, we see 
three different areas that I think are crucially important. One is the empowerment and engagement of the community. This isn't an individual issue, though individuals suffer greatly from it, but we need to empower that community because it's the community that provides the response, not the individual. And how do we do that? We, we've had great success in some areas and we need greater success in a legal framework. So when you start talking about um, laws, about inheritance, a woman whose husband dies in Malawi now loses all her property, her house, and any opportunity she has for an economic income. How can she take care of her children? Is she subject now to greater vulnerability? Is she subject to the will and whim of other people? We need to help assist in changing these laws. So inheritance laws, a young girl has the opportunity for some viability and livelihood after. The wife has some viability. We need to increase trafficking laws, as we heard from Congressman Poe, trafficking, a, a, a key scourge uh, throughout the world, and seeing more and more of those type of activities. So there is a legislative framework. There's a media framework. We have found that in refugee camps and high concentration areas when we've had specific violence in areas, if we get the civil society, the religious leaders, you get the priests, the ministers, the rabbis, the imams to come on the radio and talk about how we need to work together, how, it's, how it is shameful and how it isn't courageous for someone to attack a woman, but it is courageous to defend the woman and to defend the family. In many of these areas, attacking a woman is attacking the social fabric of the society. It is tearing the social fabric of that society, and it is tearing the family apart. People cannot grow. They cannot develop. The investments we made are inconsequential if we allow that to happen. So we have found, similar to what Zihan said, that we need to integrate it into everything we do. Our agricultural projects, they have to be women in development projects. We don't just have a safe house, but we have a safe house that's linked to many other activities. So it's c inclusive programming, it's the legislative framework, and then we need to codify certain rights and responsibilities throughout the development sector on the right roles for security personnel and what roles that they have. And then also any of our programming, we need to take into consideration the roles that women play in these communities. Often it, they're susceptible when they go out for water, which they spend many hours doing. When they go out for fuel, whether that's cooking uh, materials or others. When they go in the camps in Haiti, key issue, when they go to uh, sanitation facilities, are there lights there? Can we develop a network so that someone is watching her stall as she, as she showers, that there's a community there that protects the children and the women? So we found by trying to reach out to the greater community, we can have a much greater impact. Great, thank you. Kent, you have spent time in and out of government um, looking at this issue, working on this issue. And from your perspective, you know, what, what works and in particular, what useful role should our government or other governments be, be playing? Um, I think one of the great myths right now is because of the deficit and all the pressure on the budgets, there's almost a kind of despair that we can really get the U.S. government and the Congress to give us the kind of funds we need for a whole host of problems, including this one, which is fairly far down the list, unfortunately, of a lot of things that get attention. But I think that's a great myth. And the reason it's a myth is because there is money available. It's, this is not primarily a money problem. The U.S. government is in a position to make a, a big impact. Let me give you a few examples. Quite apart from the international affairs budget, it's the pressure that the United States government can put on other governments that have to do with their domestic laws, their prosecution. Uh, they can encourage them with all sorts of carrots, uh, etc that uh, they ought to do this. It's got to be a community solution anyway. We can't dictate this from the UN or the US or from the EU. It's got to be them. The government can play a huge role in activating the government to do what it is in a position to do. Secondly, when it does have a grant that it can do for this, and there's money available, you can do it. You can set the RFAs up in such a way that they require, give a competitive advantage to any international NGO that will bring to the table a match, significant private resources from a whole series of um, sources they may have. Mm -hmm. That will encourage money to come in that isn't USG, taxpayer money. You can do that. You can require or you can give a competitive advantage to any proposal 
that is built on community participation, mm -hmm. huge community participation, because really the key is going to be that no matter what. And uh, that way you give the little bit of money you may have, which can be several <coughs> million, but you will leverage it in a way that will be uh, very much more powerful. So there's a lot the U.S. government can do, even at a time of constrained budgets. Mm -hmm. Great, great. I want to open it up before we get too far um, to, for you to join the conversation um, and check in and see if we've got anything from our Twitter fall, if any tweets have come through that um, want to be answered, and uh, which we can't read from here. so. Uh, and, and to allow you to, to get into the conversation. So what's on your mind? What's pissing you off? What, do you, what would you really like to, to know? Yes. Hi, Janae Ingram with the National Action Network. And I was just wondering if any of you could speak to um, women in entrepreneurship in these areas and how that uh, aids in women becoming stronger and more independent. Great, great. Let's take another question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to figure and understand better how you integrate a lot of the programs that you talked about, Ken, and uh, the others you talked about. How do you integrate the funding from the U.S. government to the international institutions down to the level that Maria talked about, where the frustration is really, really high? How do you get those priorities raised? Great. Thank you. So do you want to start? Um, what's exciting, we talked about earlier, what's going to be announced today is a policy from USAID where across every sector, gender has to be looked at. Gender issues have to be looked at, they have to be measured, and any money that's going out from the USAID to international NGOs, corporations, whatever it is, um, all the projects have to be looked through, uh, through the gender lens. So I think that's really exciting, and I think it's going to help in that funneling things down to the local communities and the smaller um, activists. And on entrepreneurship, in our focus groups and conferences, the number one thing that women um, wanted were, of course, is you know economic opportunity. Um, and for us to have some sort of, especially in Haiti, what's happening with reconstruction right now, a quota system almost for the contracts that are being sent there for, um, for all of the corporations working there, that they have to have a certain amount of women um, employees. And the biggest gap, and Joe and I were talking about this earlier, is the SMEs, which a lot of people are really interested in right now. It's not the micro loans so much. It's these um, mid-sized businesses uh, building strong local businesses, especially women-run businesses or businesses that employ women. Um, to uh, build the capacity for their economic independence, which will surely help to curb and does help to curb, like you were saying earlier, any sort of violence against women. And I just I want to point out that on the gender policy that's going to be released um, in about an hour or less, uh, we were also successful in getting integrated into that, that the lens on gender needs to look at gender-based violence specifically and explicitly. So exactly like you were saying, Ken, every project, whether it's a road or a farming project or a business development project, it's got to incorporate that in it. So very exciting. I'd just like to, to make the suggestion that you can get almost unanimous support for dealing with gender-based violence. And I think it's very important to keep as big a tent as possible among those who are participating. And what I want to uh, uh, say is that is a kind of a warning that if we throw into the discussion of women's issues, um, reproductive rights, and a lot of things where there's a lot of disagreement, which we're not going to solve here, and people are going to remain divided on. But if we set things up in a way that certain people are excluded from helping on gender-based violence or trafficking or whatever the cause is, because they don't hold the views of some others under that tent will we'll hurt women. And I, I just would argue that we really need the churches, the faith-based groups, there'll be diversity of opinions there, but you can get unanimity on attacking this particular issue. And it's such an important issue that I would, want, I would not want it to uh, uh, get shortchanged by that. The other thing I want to say quickly is I'm all for microenterprises for women. We, uh, World Vision, I have done much of what the rest of the community has done. We've focused on women. But I just want to say that this men problem is the big elephant in the room. 
If we don't start to find a way to program more effectively to change cultural attitudes, uh, this problem is going to be with us for a long time no matter what the laws say. We have got to find a way to bring men into the discussion, uh, encourage modeling of good men that boys see when they grow up. Because we all know boys, they're going to be influenced by the men in their community. So the men that are uh, appropriately behaving towards women, they need to be champions. They need to be models. We've got to find a way to address that issue. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, yeah, I, I think skills training in women is one of the most empowering things that one can do for women. For instance, I'm a midwife. My country, Somaliland, is a country with the highest maternal mortality rate. Women are dying of causes that no woman should die of in this day and age. They're dying of simple things that could be easily prevented or managed if caught early. And one out of, only one out of 10 women has access to proper care during pregnancy and childbirth. So what I have taken upon myself, and if God in his grace gives me time, is to build, is to train 1,000 midwives to go to isolated areas. Those in cities have access to medical care, but there are women living in urban communities and distant regions and districts who have nothing, no one to care for them. So training midwives is a very cost-effective, time-effective, low-tech. It costs us less than the cost of a cup of coffee a day to train a midwife. We train them in two years. These women go back to their communities empowered competent, vocal, and help us to fight many of the problems of women. But what is our problem? We cannot find enough trainers. We do not have the resources, neither the technical capacity to train them. And this is the appeal that I'm watching to the world. Please give us a hand and also replicate this. Learn from the example of Somaliland. If Somaliland, a country which is almost on the dark side of the moon, can do it mm -hmm. and, re and reduce maternal mortality rate to a quarter of the national rate only by the simple training of midwives, anybody can do it. Any country in Africa can do it. Any country where risks of pregnancy are high, train midwives. Train doctors, yes. But doctors take a long time to train. They cost a lot to train. And then when they are trained, they don't want to go out to little villages. They want to stay in, in, in an environment where they have facilities and access to equipment and sophisticated <laughs> medical um, institutions. But midwives are flexible, and they're women. And they can influence many of the social problems that women have. They become confident. I, I, I'm always fascinated to see the little girls who came in at 18, come in for training, who can hardly look me in the face. And after the training, they're competent, they're teachers, and all it has cost is less than the cost of a cup of coffee. For you, it's nothing. For us, it's a lot. But it's a life-saving training that we can give them. Learn from us. We have the curriculum. We've had the experience. We've done it. We've proved it. We have a track record of 10 years. Next week, my hospital will be 10 years old. Thank God. It's, it, we can do it. If Somaliland can do it, anybody can do it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I, I just might, might add to the question of entrepreneurship. I, I, I think it's a key, key question, and I think it does address uh, some of what Kent was saying in that we have found that by um, providing an opportunity for women to release their power within the community, that their stature within that community is raised. I spent two days traveling by road, because we couldn't get out because of snow, from Bamiyan to Gore in Afghanistan, and sitting in a mosque with women and men, with the women participating more than the men because of what they had done with their potato crop, what they were going to do with their savings, how they were, the excitement that they showed, and the fact, the recognition that the men saw these women as participants in the community, as people that could help lead them to the future, also allowed them to educate their girls and send them to school. So we traveled for two days and we'd be driving and people said, well, this might be a dangerous area and we'd see people out and a big congregation of people and we're going, what are we coming into? It was students out in the grass, tw 10 feet away from each other, taking exams because they didn't have a school facility, to have, but the hunger that they had 
because of some of this outreach into isolated rural areas, because of some of this entrepreneurship, because of the training, because of the activities, because they did have some teachers out in those areas. So I think it's a crucial area that levels the playing field a little bit more and shows the balance that women are great contributors. Rita, we have a question via Twitter, if you'd like. The One Campaign wants to know, how does violence against women contribute to poverty around the world? Great. We can answer the question from the One Campaign. If they will do an action alert. <laughs> so anyone want to want to talk about that link between poverty um, and violence? It's, it's there. Hmm? Yeah. Sina. Yeah, it, it is there actually. It's it's uh, in Iraq. Let's say it's reason number one uh, behind violence against women. So if you provide them with small amounts of money, or if you give them the chance to work and to have some income, uh, I'm sure I'm positive that the violence uh, rates will reduce. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we're saying that violence only occurs among people living in poverty by any by any means. I don't want anybody to misunderstand that. It's the stress that is caused by that economic uncertainty. And in situations where stress is increased, whether it's a disaster um, in Haiti or economic stress, uh, that's the linkage. That's when you see violence really go up. Does anybody else want to? Yeah, you see, it's very difficult to, to be violent against a woman who is powerful, who has, uh, who, who's not poor, who's educated, uh, who has a voice, and who has the potential to defend herself either physically or in a court. But the majority of women just take it because it's perpetrated against them, their relatives, everybody they know has been punched in the nose or kicked around, so they just take it in their stride. But when you when women become empowered and educated, they stand up and say, hey, wait a minute. You cannot do that to me or to my sister or to my neighbor. So it is a deterrent. Education is empowering, uh, and uh, uh, that power is a deterrent. I hope I have answered your question. I might just add one, one point, and I think it's a, it's a simple economic uh, equation in my mind. If you don't use 50% of your assets at this terrible economic time, what a waste, you know, what an absolute waste. To realize that potential of a very dynamic 50%, think of the economic development that could happen there, think of the outreach that could happen, and it's actually even more than the balance of 50%, because when you look at investments in women and the translation to poverty within the household, certainly the investment in women reflects much more on how the family is going to prosper in the future than, than even men. So key, key element is why deprive yourself of 50%? I know many of us here couldn't survive if we did not have that partner who was helping us along you know, with our lives. How could we deprive that of nations that are struggling uh, and don't have the prosperity that we have in this country? Ritu, I just want to yes. mention that I, I want to say something about another dimension, what actually happens if the violence occurs. The impact is so dramatic. I've had several women work for me in different uh, per, uh, positions I've had, who, and a few men, but mainly women, who are the victims of, of abuse. And the psychological trauma that they struggle with for decades, with their whole lives, is just, uh, it's hard to believe unless you've heard the stories or unless somebody's experienced it. So you got to nip this before it really, because this will affect everything about their lives. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in northwest Kenya, went to a school that World Vision set up for victims of female uh, mutilation, genital mutilation, and for those who were escaping it, running away from it. And the whole purpose of the school was to provide a safe haven where most of them had managed to escape, and a few of them were victims, but to have a safe place where they could go and recover their dignity or keep their dignity. But we have to spend more time thinking about the victims uh, and, and not just talking about preventing it, but also we've got this huge problem of dealing with victims, a very tough problem to deal with, but it should be part of what we think about. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons that violence is such a widely used and powerful tool is because it, it destroys a woman, you know, as Edna said, all the way to her core um, and to her soul that takes many, many years to recover from. So the costs are just uh, enormous, enormous.
Do we have other Twitter questions or audience questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Alexandra Barnett. Would you like to speak into the mic? Oh, sure. I guess it's more of a comment than a question. Um, my name is Alexandra Barnett. I'm with Creative Associates International. Thanks so much for doing this event today. Um, I recently returned from two years in Afghanistan working on the Ambassador Small Grants Program mm -hmm. that was started by Ambassador Revere. And it was an amazing experience, completely opened my eyes to the status of women around the world and, and many of the problems specifically in, specifically in Afghanistan. One of the initiatives that we started on, under that program was the Afghan Women's Advocacy Coalition, which is um, the largest group of Afghan women's organizations um, in Afghanistan that have come together with the Ministry of, of Women's Affairs. And I know that uh, Minister Ghazanfar was hoping to be here today, and I think her trip was, was unfortunately canceled. But one of the things that we learned from many of the women's groups that we worked with is a huge problem in Afghanistan and, and possibly in other countries, I'm not sure, but violence that's perpetrated against women, yes, oftentimes it's the men who are at fault, but many other times it's actually the women who are at fault. So it's, it's mothers-in-law that are beating and abusing and killing their daughters-in-law. Um, <coughs> and there's no access, there's no access to the justice system, you know, for women in Afghanistan, where can they go or in other countries if, if they are abused? And um, what we found, I think, working with smaller community organizations is the importance of joint programming. So if you are doing you know, an economic development activity to combine that with an advocacy initiative, women learning about their rights. And I think there's a lot of development organizations now that are doing work you know, specifically focused on conflict mitigation or violence prevention. And in my opinion, I think that's much less effective than combining it with like an economic development. Mm -hmm. Um, activity. So, right. yes. yeah. well, thank Just you. Interested. Thank you. I think, I mean, one of the key tenets of our advocacy on violence is not to have separate programs on violence. We have advocated very strongly against that. They need to be um, incorporated into everything else. Right. It, 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 I, I love what you're saying, and we found this too in Haiti. It has to be a holistic approach. We, we started a program, um, this empowerment program. We decided to put our center of operations in the poorest slum in the Western Hemisphere, in the poorest country, because we really believe in working from the very bottom up. And the empowerment program trains 20 people in our neighborhood um, uh, in lessons on health, hygiene, gender-based violence, democracy. We teach from the very beginning, don't put a machete down where your two-year-old can touch it. After six weeks, we build up to gender-based violence. So they're open and receptive, men and women, and you know the light bulbs that go on, even in our adult education classes, while we're teaching um, English, while we're teaching Creole, Part of that is gender-based violence is woven in there. So I think you're exactly right, and we're saying that that's the most effective thing as well. And also the coalition of women that you're talking about, the idea that you know we're stronger together than we are alone. To be able to advance, it's about building those bridges between the women's groups. I have another yes, example yeah. about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, in one of the uh, Iraq uh, North areas, we have we were calling women just join us for like awareness session regarding either gender-based violence or human rights and nobody showed up. We were calling women for three weeks and nobody showed up. Then we changed our strategy. We said we have like a health session. We will deliver uh, hygienic kits and we have an educational project and we will give you like such and such tools. Everybody did come. And uh, through, through those ses sessions, we started giving them like uh, a little about human rights or uh, violence against women. So in that case, we deliver the message, the message that we want to deliver, but in different, uh, in different shape. So it's good to change our strategy whenever it's needed. Tell, tell everybody that story you told us yesterday about how some mm -hmm. of the women reacted when they started to oh, learn yeah. about their yeah. rights. Uh, we had a group of uh, around 25 uh, women who are, are joining us for one of the gender, human uh, rights uh, session. And the, the uh, instructor was telling them, you cannot, somebody cannot do this for you. They start laughing, said, are you kidding me? Is, is that one of my rights? Sh should my husband don't do that to me? It's, it's like a joke for them. They don't know exactly what was their right. They don't know what's, uh, how they should be treated by their partner. So yeah, it's, it's really bad. Yeah. 
One of the favorite things that I saw that I told you last night from our adult English class, we graduated 48 people within a week. Half of them had their first jobs ever, which was pretty amazing. But we got a letter from a gentleman that took the class um, that said, um, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to beat my wife. Thank you. And just to get that letter and to know that it had that sort of effect is gigantic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And commenting on that also, um, previously we were just uh, engaging women in all these uh, activities. Like one of the, whenever there's a, uh, a session or a workshop, we just uh, ad, uh, like invite women. Then, you know, women alone cannot do any difference or small difference in their houses. So what we did, we started inviting men also to these sessions. Also, they, they don't come that much, but they did. And so both men and women, they, they can make a difference in their houses. So when you educate women, it's better to educate the, her husband too, so both of them can start really a healthy family. And what we did also, we started uh, targeting girls at school age, because eventually they will be mothers of the future. And uh, so we are looking for, like in the coming 10 years from today, things should be uh, better than now, mm -hmm. inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> I think we have some more questions over here. Great. <coughs> yes, please. Good morning. I'm Ludi Green, and I'm the president and founder of Second Chance Employment Services, the first and only employment agency in the United States for domestic violence victims. And I want you all to be aware of our existence. Currently, just partnered about a year ago with Manpower, the largest employment agency in the world, who's helping us now expand internationally. And I would like to have a question for you all to give me some assistance. Coming from corporate sector, I basically we, the service that we provide, we use a lot of technology. And some of the things is I like to measure the outcomes of my programs to a web-based system that we use called WTRAC. I would like to know for transparency of the programs done overseas and to see the effectiveness of what, how you provide the services for the different type of victims that you do from the employment that have her and the other services that they may need at the time. What type of technology you are currently using? Thank Great. you. Thanks. Let me take the, the other question so we can then answer them both as we wrap up. And back. back. Yes, sir. Then we're going to take one more question. Thank you for this um, discussion. My name is Judith. I'm with Women for Men International, and I'm originally from Haiti, so thank you for your work in Haiti. Uh, my question, well, it's actually more common than it is a question. One of the things I think we need to keep in mind when we talk about the role of men and women around this issue of gender-based violence and gender equality is the fact that we are all on some way or another are born and raised to behave in a certain way. And I think the biggest discussion, especially that I've seen in our work and in my experience working in this sector, is that we often come at it as if, you know, we exclude the fundamental role of the social structure, society. So for the long time now, we've had this whole integration of gender equality, gender mainstreaming, and part of it, and for the longest time, the discussion around this issue have been with women. And for the first time, I think, in the last five years, we've witnessed a trend of actually getting more men into the discussion. In a lot of circle, a lot of people are still very, um, you know, men the perpetrators, women the victims. And I think part of the thing that we need to constantly keep in mind is the role of society. How do we need to actually integrate in our education system across the board and within the context of men who are in leadership position to actually get those systems indoctrinated. Because the biggest challenge is that these fundamental issues, they are more social structures, they are embedded in our societies, in our, in our structure in terms of how we are raised to be girl, how we are raised to be boy, and the role of masculinity and femininity. And so part of our programming, and maybe you, you guys might want to comment on how you actually integrate, work with the education system within the various places where you work, so that these issues can be more integrated and adopted by those in leadership position because I think that's where more work needs to be done around the gender mainstreaming and gender equality issues. Thank right. you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Applegar. Good morning. I told I don't need a mic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, come back to the, uh, as we focus on individuals, there's a lot of what we talk about, and it just perhaps goes on the last question, it's creating the social and legal environment. You mentioned the cases in Malawi. Uh, where people, women came in on a bank account. It's very hard to be an entrepreneur if you can on a bank account. And, but what kind of things and how would you best, uh, what's the best way to approach changing that? We can't simply go in and tell a government, do this or that, or change the law on their behalf. But what kind of things you found to be effective? What are the best ways to approach that? 
Great. Anyone want to start? We've been asked about uh, technology, uh, social change, cultural change, and um, last question on uh, kind of how to how to integrate, how to get countries to do things. How do you really make that happen effectively? Well, I'll give you an example from Romania with respect to how you can actually change the laws. Uh, Romania under Ceausescu is one of the worst places for children you could find on the planet. The, the lack of protection for uh, homeless kids, et cetera, was, was really awful. But there have been huge changes in the legal structure there. By contact with European and American, uh, other countries, showing them what other societies do to protect and provide help for, and they've changed a lot of the legislation so it can be done. In Africa, there are changes going on related to FGM. Uh, yeah, you have to keep working on the culture stuff, but you can make the changes. The U.S. Congress a few years ago passed something which uh, categorized countries in terms of how they dealt with trafficking. And you get to get low ratings and high ratings. And I used to have meetings with prime ministers, etc. And before I would even bring up the issue, they would tell me why the rating was wrong and what they were doing to get the next higher rating. They didn't like being viewed as, as uh, not a good place relative to the treatment of women. So these kind of things make a difference. It can change the laws. It can, it can help. It can help a great deal. On the question of men, uh, I, I want to keep coming back to this issue because it, this is the issue we have really got to, we've really got to fight about. Um, I can remember in the PEPFAR years, we had posters that went out by some of the NGOs that said things like, real men don't. Mm -hmm. It could be a whole list of things because uh, real men do lots of things that real men shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. But uh, it had an impact. Certain things uh, became, were frowned on in the community after this. Uh, but they kind of grew up thinking, well, real men do. They get drunk. They take advantage of women. They do all those kinds of things. You have to, you have to posit a different model, and you can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Maybe just on the, the technology question, uh, I think we have gone into a positive evolution in the way that we do monitoring and evaluation of programs and evaluation of how things are, are they effective or not. Historically it was, did we, have, did we meet the objectives, did we meet the donor objectives of the organization. More and more now we're having the participants participate in evaluating the program. So in programs, there's things such as a child well-being tool where children can evaluate, are the services correct? Did I feel secure in the environment? Was the outreach appropriate? How did people uh, manage that? In addition to that, now with some technology, and it varies obviously in communities, but with some cell phone access in place, there are hotlines that people can have in refugee camps. There are, are areas where they can text and all. And so the safety and security issues can be brought up in a kind of whistleblower type of system so that we can get information directly from the participants. In addition to that, it's making sure that all of those who are working with the communities have signed on to codes of conduct, that people understand what that means, that they're held to very uh, strident standards, and that security in those areas are also educated on that because sometimes it's the security forces that are actually perpetrating the violence. So more and more, this technology has opened it up and created a safer environment, or at least an environment where messages can get back to people without someone having to walk to a particular area and be seen as the one reporting it, and then oftentimes they were subjected to greater violence after. And I think in the case of violence against women, we can broaden our definition of technology. For many women, whistle a whistle is technology. Yeah. A lock on a door is technology. So not just information technology, but, but simple things can make a difference. Maybe if I can also use another example, is that you take it for granted that you have women police officers. Countries like mine, we don't. We didn't for a long, long time. But now we have women police officers who are trained to listen and help women who have been victims of torture because many women who have been mistreated either by a relative or a husband or a male or a female don't like to complain about it. They don't like to talk about it. They feel ashamed. They feel responsible that they have put themselves in a position where they could get hurt. But if there is another woman that they can talk to, they feel more secure and they feel more confident to go and seek help. So a simple simple thing like a woman who is educated and who is trained to listen and do something about um, such an action, I think 
goes a long way in communities where that did not exist before that. And, and also, what, we've, what the question was asked about the governments, how do we uh, get them to take on laws that are going to support these things, I'm going to do a call to action to everybody in this room because we all know this. Money talks. We have to get out the word to all of these governments and around the world that it's, it's smart to invest in women and girls. It's smart in terms of having a more stable democracy, a, you know, a, a fast-building um, uh, uh, economy. I mean, when we look at Rwanda and the 30% quota, and now they have the most women of women in the parliament, look what's happening in that country economically. So, you know, if we can all put the word out there um, statistically that it's proven that this is a smart thing, I think that's really going to help change the government stance in well, many I countries. I think even building on that, Paul, an agency that you are familiar with, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, um, held out basically the aid from the U.S. government as a carrot to other countries, saying, exactly. you know, we can't invest if half your population has no property rights. It's just not a smart investment for us. So right. what do you think about maybe doing something about that? So, you know, we have, we have so much power, um, I think, with our money and with our aid. You know, yes, it's going down a little bit, but there's still so much there um, to work with. Any last comments from our panel? Follow up with that. Sure. I think one of the other things we did, though, was say, point out they could not accomplish their objectives. Exactly. And it was really their program. We point out you could not accomplish your objectives if you don't increase the economic abilities and legal power of women to help participate in the program, help grow in our program. And I think once we put it in that context, rather than making conditionality, because mm -hmm. if people right. exist in conditionality, but if you say you better, you accomplish your objective better by doing this or that, it had a much better impact and it was much more effective. Yes. And I think for us at Thrive, that's the power of advocacy. Now, that's the power of advocacy to get our government to use its influence in that way to create really transformative change. So, um, in, we're going to have to close. I just want to add one small okay. piece, but the advocacy piece is important only if you do it holistically. Yes. The U.S. government does it haphazardly in various different places around the world, but until you approach it holistically, you can't get the force of the government behind the whole process. Absolutely, and that's what we are still working to do. I want to ask you again, we've had an amazing panel. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming from so far, or close, um, to join us this morning. And, and ask again that you please take some action because that's what's going to end this problem, not another breakfast on Capitol. Lovely as it was, um, it's all of us doing something about it. So thank you very, very much for coming to our fourth annual breakfast. Uh, have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next year here, if not before. Have a great day.